Happy Monday. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. This is another one that Christy Arnhart has researched and written up, and I just want to stop and give Christy a very big thank you. I really appreciate all the help that she's been giving the channel over the past several years, but really um, taking on this duty of researching and writing up Case Cracked has allowed me to do so many other great things. I really appreciate her time and effort, and I hope you guys do too. This is a story we like to call a Halloween nightmare in Napa. Resting in the heart of California's idyllic wine country, Napa is located just an hour north of San Francisco and about an hour south of Sacramento. This town offers many activities, such as interactive street art, quiet river walks, hidden wine tasting rooms, and a lively farmer's market. But with not much resembling a nightlife, Napa seemed an unlikely choice for three young, career-oriented women in their 20s, but that is exactly where Lauren, Adrian, and Leslie chose to live together and pursue their dreams. Leslie Mazzara worked at the Nybaum Coppola Winery in the sales department, where her vibrant social energy was put to good use. She loved eating out and dancing and had even studied classical ballet for 15 years. Lauren was the quiet one. The most athletic of the three, she coached volleyball at the local community college and also played volleyball and soccer in adult leagues in the area. To make the move into her first home more comfortable, she even brought along her dog, Chloe. Adrian and Sonia was an assistant engineer at the Napa Sanitation District. She also loved volleyball and volunteered as a scorekeeper at Napa Valley Community College. Adrian also brought with her a tight-knit group of friends that included Ben Katz, Lily Prudhomme, and Lily's boyfriend, Eric Koppel, all of whom frequently came over for beer, pizzas, and movies. By 7 p.m. on Halloween night 2004, Lauren was back home after a long day, ready for the night's fun. With the time for trick-or-treaters quickly approaching, Lauren was happy to be home. Adrian and Leslie were at the front door, playfully feigning fright at the children who were already showing up. The house supply of candy was going fast, but the girls didn't mind. They couldn't hand it out fast enough. Lauren was the only one who wasn't quite as enthusiastic about the annual holiday ritual. Her aging dog, Chloe, a German Shepherd mix, didn't like strangers and barked each and every time someone rang the doorbell. By 9 p.m., trick-or-treaters were winding down and the girls were settling in for the night. Even though it was Halloween, they had no plans to go to a party or a bar because the next day was Monday. It was a work day. By 10.30 p.m., all of the girls were getting ready for bed. Lauren let her dog Chloe outside and closed up the house. I did the normal thing, she said. I checked to make sure all the doors were locked and secured and then went to bed about 11 p.m. Unfortunately, tired as she was, she did not check the windows. And by 11.30, she was asleep. Between 1.30 and 2 in the morning, a security light activated behind the garage. Chloe gave a warning bark, and Lauren awoke. She could see the light from her downstairs bedroom, but she figured a cat must have tripped the motion sensor. She quieted her dog and began drifting back to sleep. But within minutes, she heard someone entering the house and going up the stairs. Thinking it could be Leslie's boyfriend, she quieted her dog again and drifted back to sleep. The next sound she heard was a terrified scream followed by a loud commotion. It was Adrian, and she was fighting for her life. She kept screaming, oh my God, please help, please help, Lauren would recall. Running from her room, Lauren quickly made her way to the stairs to help her roommate. But as she placed her feet on the first step, the intruder came bounding down the stairs directly towards her. He was just flying down the stairs, breaking stuff as he came around, Lauren said. In a panic, she ran in the opposite direction, going out the back door. Unfortunately, the backyard was surrounded by a six-foot privacy fence that Lauren couldn't climb. In that moment, she feared that she had given the intruder the perfect opportunity to assault her, too. Lauren hid and heard the attacker struggling with the kitchen blinds at the front of the house. As things began to quiet down... She could hear Adrian's pleas for help. Not knowing if the intruder had left or not, Lauren went back into the house to help her roommate. 
After trying to call 911 from the kitchen and finding the line dead, she decided to quietly go upstairs and check on her friends. What she saw is something she will never forget. The entire bedroom floor was covered in blood. Leslie was face down in a pile of clothes with stab wounds all over her upper body and arms. A few feet away, Adrian was crouched behind her bed. Although she was alive, she was no longer able to speak and would eventually bleed to death from multiple stab wounds. Lauren ran back downstairs and got her cell phone, quickly dialing 911. Realizing that the intruder could still be nearby, she drove away in her car as she told the operator her information. This horrific double murder was a blow to the Napa community. The town hadn't been the subject of a murder investigation in two years. Residents were quick to raise a $100,000 reward to be offered for information leading to an arrest. Police scoured the crime scene, collecting over 200 items of potential evidence from microscopic fibers to a unique pair of cigarette butts. They even found what they think was the killer's blood, just a drop, outside a broken kitchen window. After interviewing 1,300 people, investigators still couldn't identify the culprit. Lauren verified with police that nothing from the house had been taken and gave investigators some more potential suspects. She told them about an old boyfriend of Leslie's and a handyman that had recently been in the house. They also had alibis and were eliminated. Two weeks after the murders, a candlelight vigil was held and attended by many members of the community, including Adrian's tight-knit group of friends, Ben, Lily, and her now fiancé, Eric. But even after such horrific events, life goes on, and in February 2005, when Lily and Eric wed, they invited Adrian's mother, Arlene Allen, to read from the Bible in memory of her slain daughter. Lauren, however, continued to live in a constant state of fear. After almost a year, she still couldn't sleep through the night. Basically, it was a horror movie. That's what I thought. Exactly what I thought when I was up there, she said. In September of 2005, police decided to take a closer look at the two cigarette butts found at the scene. After extracting DNA from the filters, they found that that DNA matched the blood also found by the kitchen window. With this profile, investigators were able to determine that it was a white male, most likely of North European descent, and he would probably have blonde hair and green eyes. In September of 2005, police contacted Lauren, telling her that the killer was probably a smoker, and they asked if she knew any smokers of a particular brand of camel cigarette called Turkish Gold. She remembered that Eric Koppel, who had been to the house many times, smoked. Investigators reached out, but unfortunately, Eric wasn't returning their phone calls, and he couldn't be located. Thankfully, less than a week after police announced their findings to the press, Eric Koppel turned himself in. Before surrendering, Koppel mailed letters to two of his family members. In the letters, he confessed to the murders of Leslie and Adrian and said he was going to end his own life. After not going through with the attempt, family convinced him to turn himself in to police. But even with the confession, investigators still had no idea why he had committed such an act. In court, the details of that night would finally come out. Koppel states that he was in a bad place. He and Lily had broken off their engagement at the advice of her closest friend, Adrian. He went to a friend's party that night where he became very drunk and angrier and angrier about the fact that the next day, November 1st, was supposed to have been his wedding day. After driving to the victim's house, just after midnight, he stood outside smoking cigarettes before entering through a downstairs kitchen window. Koppel told detectives that after that, the details become fuzzy and he couldn't remember exactly what happened next. After finding himself back at home with a knife, his clothes covered in blood, Koppel told investigators that he tossed the knife, but he couldn't remember where. He also said he burned the clothes he was wearing in a fire pit at his house. It can often take decades for justice to be carried out because of long trials and multiple legal appeals causing a lot of hardship for the victim's families. Rather than drag the families through this process, a mediator helped them reach what they felt was a compassionate outcome for everyone. Prosecutors announced that Koppel would avoid the death penalty by pleading guilty to two counts of first-degree murder and special conditions of lying in wait, the use of a knife, and committing a crime with multiple victims. 
he agreed to spend the rest of his life behind bars, waived his rights to seek an appeal, and agreed that he could never profit financially from either of their deaths. With this plea, the families would be finished with the judicial process and could finally start to heal. Koppel's wife, Lily, addressed the court at his sentencing, saying that she believed that depression and alcohol brought Eric to do the things that he did. In the days before he confessed, I knew something was terribly bothering him. I told him, Eric, there is nothing in this world that you could do to make me love you less. Those words are just as true today as they were that afternoon, she stated. Koppel was also given the opportunity to address those he had hurt so terribly. After apologizing to the families of those he had killed, Koppel told the court about the day he turned himself into authorities. I didn't want to take the answers to my grave. When I talked to police, I told the truth as God is my witness. Arlene Allen pounded her fist on a podium time and time again, echoing the stabbing motion she said Eric Koppel used to take the life of her daughter, Adrian. My baby never wore a turtleneck sweater in her life, and yet she had to be buried in one, and still it could not hide the extent of her wounds. You are the man who is so cruel as to invite me, the mother of the woman you murdered, to stand up for you at your wedding, to read scripture to you of love and death, and to bless your union. Throughout that weekend, you brought me into the heart of your family, knowing all the while it was you who destroyed mine. Koppel clasped his hands on the table and hung his head as she continued. You will be forgotten. When that door closes behind you today, I will think of you no more, she said. Case cracked. I want to give a big thank you to Dateline, uh, Forensic Files, CBS News, Wikipedia, NapaValley.com, ABC News, SFGate.com, and the Napa Valley Register for providing information that contributed to today's story. Um, that statement that Arlene makes at the end is just so powerful. Um, it, it, it's kind of heart-wrenching that she came to realize who had actually done this to her daughter. And then it had to almost be like a second shock of thinking, wait, that's the guy who I spoke at his wedding. Like they did this thing to honor my daughter at his wedding. It is just, it's such a perverse twist on all this. And it's interesting because I was talking to Christy about this case and I kind of believe that maybe he doesn't remember exactly what he did. You know, if this is someone that um, hasn't groomed himself to violence, it could be that the imagery of it was so shocking that his mind just kind of ejected all that information. But then to hear that this happened where a mother of one of the victims was invited to his wedding, it kind of makes you think the other way. Like, was he doing that for some type of personal satisfaction in some way? Um, especially knowing the story that, you know, he was effectively killing one of his harshest critics, someone that, um, you know, had the ear of the woman he was trying to marry and was telling her, this isn't a good guy for you. Uh, seems like she was not far off in that assessment at all. Uh, also another item of note, police never found the murder weapon and Lauren's last name was actually withheld from several of the reports and photos of her are somewhat scarce. Um, I know that there is no immediate risk to her anymore, but I still kind of wanted to honor the fact that her identity was being somewhat protected as this story was developing and being released. And yeah, he's in jail, but um, I still didn't want to give her any unnecessary attention or um, kind of highlight her in that way. So that's why I haven't included her last name here. We haven't showed any photos of her. Um, she is a survivor and I imagine that it's hard whenever this story kind of comes back around and, you know, pops up in her face somewhere. So that's why we chose to do that. Uh, Koppel is now spending the rest of his life in San Quentin. And finally, you know, we always look for the bright spots in these stories. A cottage for abused children is being built in Leslie Mazzara's honor in Anderson, South Carolina, where she grew up. A big thank you to new patrons, Diane, Kelly Jo Hapgood, 
Anna, I believe it's Schoenbach, but I'll say Schoenbach also. I'm sure it's one or the other. Anne-Marie Fortier and When the Sun Hits. Thank you so much for joining on Patreon. On top of that, a big thank you to Heidi for increasing her pledge. If you want to help support the channel, support mine and Christy's work here, you can do that over at www.lordandarts.com. You can sign up for PayPal, sign up for Patreon, buy merchandise. All of it helps support our efforts here. Thank you so much for spending time with us here today on Case Cracked. I'll see you back here on Wednesday with a brand new episode of Searchlight on the Lord and Arts channel.